ask you to join me as we pray and invite the Lord's presence in our study in a special way right now, after which I'm going to be sharing a PowerPoint, at least for part of the study. The rest of it, then I might just, we might just have to take up our Bibles. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the wonderful experience of entering into your rest. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of the Sabbath and, and the many privileges that it brings of coming together as a family, your church family, just to fellowship and to engage your minds with your word, to commune with you in a, in a special way which has been, you've invited us into to put aside all things, all else, and to enter into this time of fellowship and communion with each other and primarily with you, dear God. So we pray that we are here now. We pray that you will bless us. As we are gathered, Lord, we commit everything into your care, into your hands. We pray that your Holy Spirit will inspire our hearts and give us understanding. And we know not everything, Lord. There's so much we don't know. But we pray that you will inspire us and give us insights, even as we go through. Give us deep insights into your truth so that we can understand you better and understand the things that we're given in your word. So from them, we can get a deeper understanding of who you really are and how you relate to us. So bless us now in Jesus' holy name. Amen. All right. So a man of like passions, part one. You know, Elijah, we figured that out by now, I'm sh pretty sure. Elijah is considered by many to be the mightiest prophet of the Old Testament. The Jews today look upon Elijah, they're still looking for Elijah to show up one day. Every time they have um, one of their national holidays, I don't remember if it's Yom Kippur or one of those other ones, they prepare a special meal. I think they have, um, not yes, one of those special national holidays that ethnic people who consider themselves ethnic Jews celebrate. They set a place at the table for Elijah to show up because one day he's going to show up at the table in physical, you know, bodily form according to their belief. But whether them or others in the Christian world, there are many people who consider Elijah to be the mightiest of the Old Testament prophets, at least the one used most mightily by God. Whether that is true or not, he is certainly a contender for the recognition of being one of those through whom God accomplished great victories. I mean, when you look at Elijah's resume, it's impressive. He confronted the apostate king Ahab and brought Israel to acknowledge the true God on Mount Carmel and performed many miracles, even raising someone from the dead. And eventually he was escorted to heaven in what is described as a chariot of fire. Shining angels in reality. Over 800 years later, after his earthly life and his departure, he shows up on Mount, the Mount of Transfiguration. Over 800 years or so later. And he shows up with Moses, a predecessor of his, and he talked with Jesus. They both talked with Jesus. And he's given to us, Elijah is given to us as a symbol of those who will be translated at the end of this world's history without coming under the dominion of death. He was mightily used by God. And yet, he was a man just like us in many ways. He too had a misunderstanding of the character of God and in many ways he fell very much short of the tolerance and the gentleness of Jesus. Elijah is a testimony of God's willingness to use imperfect men, men with defects of character, to use them as he sees in them sincerity and dedication and commitment to his glory. 
even though they might be defective in certain ways, God still condescends to use defective human beings. You see, God sees through the roughness of imperfection. And he sees what he can make of fallen human beings. And he uses them in the process of fitting them up. The, pro, um, the apostle James writes, he says, Elijah, in James 5, 17, Elias, which in the Greek means Elijah in the Hebrew, he says, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. And that's where the spin-off for our topic comes from. And he prayed earnestly that, that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. So understandably, yes, Elijah was mightily used by God, but we are focus this evening and possibly next week's is to look at that dimension of his person at a certain phase or certain phases in, in his experience where he was just of like passion. It could be glaringly seen that he was a man of like passions as we are. Used by God nonetheless, but we know what we are. <laughs> So if we were to project back from who we know ourselves are, as, and where God has taken us from what he's trying to bring us into, we can see that, you know, we, we kind of like, we will see of Elijah in many ways. During his illustrious prophetic ministry, he also did some things which many would question, such as slaying the prophets of Baal and calling down fire on soldiers who had come to escort him back to King Ahab. The question is whether or not those things are representative of the character of God. Or, and I should say also, to what degree was God involved in these things? Even among advocates of a non-violent God, there are those who say that, oh, the killing of each of those two captains, you know, the captains of the 50s, which we see 2 Kings 1, they will say, oh, that was a justifiable act of God. But based on what Jesus reveals to us concerning God, we might have to say, hmm, really? Because the fact that Elijah, a mighty man of God, used mightily by God, accomplished phenomenal things or or by God through him, doesn't necessarily mean that every aspect of his life, everything he did was necessarily according to God's will or was God's purpose or plan. The thing is that, like us, he had passions to deal with. Like us, he had defects to overcome. And like us, sometimes he had pride to deal with and sometimes he took matters into his own hands so we have to look at Elijah's story and we hopefully will be looking at it for maybe a week or two and and just seeing things a little more clearly and then extrapolating from all of that lessons that we can learn and it's humbling because it tells me I don't know what it's going to tell you it tells me that God can use even me defective as I am James gives us a clue in describing Elijah as a man of like passions. He talked about the mighty fate of Elijah in praying and it didn't rain for three and a half years and he prayed again and the rain came. But that is not the path we're going to be going down. We're going to be going down a different rabbit trail. We're just going to take that part. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are and see what we can make of that. All right? So... There is a very important statement, which I think can come in right here, very appropriately. It says, the measure of a man is not the passions that control him, but the passion that he controls. The passions that he controls. Not the passions that control him, 
but the passions that he controls. The Bible, you know, the Bible tells us that the man who is able to conquer a city is not uh, as mighty as the man who can conquer himself, control himself. Elijah did not always control his passion. So we can look in, back at the history of Elijah and his great and illustrious career and mightily as he was used by God, it doesn't mean that God endorsed everything that Elijah did throughout his ministry. Elijah did not always control his passions. Sometimes they controlled him. And by carefully examining the Bible account of Elijah, I believe we can see how Elijah might have done some of these things, not by the will of God, but according to his own passions. We're not talking about, we're talking about specific areas of his life. Because he was a man of like passions as we are. And he was subject to failures, to taking matches into his own hands, to getting off the handle at times. And, but God was working with him, working with him, and God brought him to the place where he could say, come Elijah, and took him up to him. Come up and sit with me. So that it, it, it gives me hope. It gives us hope. You know, it gives us hope. Now, the account, and I'm, I'm going to just refer to certain things because I know that we are, hopefully we are familiar with the, you know, with the, um, the, the, the Elijah story from the Bible. I believe we are, we are or should be. The account of the confrontation, there was a confrontation on Mount Carmel. And the account is well known. It was a confrontation between Elijah and the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. It is found in 1 Kings 18 from verses 19 to 39. The priests of Baal thought to bring down fire from heaven to prove that Baal was God. And they couldn't. They cut themselves. They did all kind of crazy things. But they couldn't. And then Elijah restored the altar and a simple prayer and fire came down and consumed the sacrifice on the altar. Now, and I hope as we think you're having questions in your minds, because we hopefully we'll finish earlier so we can have some questions and we can talk and, and, and hopefully I'll, I'll, let's see what your questions are. But the account here ended up with victory being won by God. It was a confrontation, not just between Elijah and the prophets of Baal, but between God and the devil's kingdom, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of light, and the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of good and the kingdom of evil. And with the victory won and the prophets of Baal humbled, Elijah gave a command. He said, take the prophets of Baal, let none of them escape. And the scripture says, and they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon, and slew them there. 450 prophets. He was the one giving the orders right there. Take them, take them down the bridge. Because the people know their hearts were turned and they said, yes, the Lord, he is God. So Elijah was looking there like the hero now. And in his zeal for the glory of God, he says, take all, he captured them and the people grabbed them, 450 prophets, take them down to the river and just off with their heads. Kill them. Now, did God tell Elijah to do that? based on our understanding of who God is, of who Jesus Christ is, and what has shown us concerning what God is all about and who God is, did God tell Elijah to do that? The Bible does not say. Was there any motive for Elijah to do such a thing? Quite possibly, there was one passion, and we're going to look at a few different ones, one passion, remember Elijah was a man of like passions as we are, and one passion that Elijah admitted that he had was that of jealousy. Now we can take that different ways. We're just looking at a few things. Jealousy. He said the same thing again. You know, he said um, in, um, you know, that I was jealous for God's glory. And he said the same thing again in verse 14. And... This was after the events on Mount Carmel. But Elijah was referring back to an event during the three and a half years of drought. When he was talking, he said he was jealous for God's glory. Now we want to look at that too and, and, and understand, you know, there's a way to, there's a holy way and an unholy way. But the, the point is that, let's, let's take a step by step. 
1 Kings 19, verse 10, and as, as I mentioned, he said, he said it also in verse 14, he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel had forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Now, understand now, while God describes himself as jealous, and jealous here might mean zealous, and that's understandable. We have to be zealous for the cause of God. But we have to understand that there are possible implications in being jealous or zealous that can take us outside of the ambit of God's functioning because we can get carried away by zeal. Just why God himself describes himself as jealous God too. We have to understand the context and what he means by this. Because while God describes himself as jealous, even in the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20 verse 5, he says, you know, if I'm a jealous God or whatever, that could be much like his wrath, which works quite, quite differently from man's wrath. For, as James tells us in James chapter 1 and verse 20, the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. In other words, man's wrath and God's wrath are two different things. So therefore, man's jealousy and God's jealousy, quite possibly, are two different things, evidently. Words used in describing the attributes and the behavior of man, when those say they mean something, they connote something, but when the same words are used in reference to God, there is no comparison. It has to carry with it the implication of something above and beyond what it would imply described as used to describe man. You know, for example, the word wrath, as I've said earlier, man's wrath is one way, and James says, look, when he says God's wrath, there's a distinction, James 1.20. It doesn't mean anger and, 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 and punitive vengeance and destructive force. That's why he says, the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God, does not produce the righteousness of God. No, God is righteous in all his ways. Even his wrath is righteous. So it can't be the same as in man's wrath. Because the psalmist says in Psalm 145, 17, that the Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. God's wrath is just merely God's honoring man's choice. The very freedom of choice that he gave mankind means, therefore, when men have made their choice, God himself has to step back and allow them to make their choice. But nevertheless, with choice comes consequences. And he has to allow it. Bible describes that stepping down, stepping back as wrath. In fact, the word wrath as used in the Old Testament comes from an ancient Aramaic word, root word. The word wrath that we see in the Old Testament, it comes from an ancient Aramaic root word, which means to be broken off from. Just like broken off, separated from. And that's what God's wrath means. To be separated from God. And we've chosen to separate ourselves from God. That man does the, makes the choice of separation. And God ultimately has to just concede. The, the, the prophet Isaiah tells us in Isaiah chapter, in Isaiah chapter 55, 7 to 9, he says, let not the righteous, in, in fact, in Isaiah 55, he says, He says that my ways are not your ways. Neither my thoughts are your thoughts, says the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. So since God is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works, and his ways are infinitely above ours and his thoughts are infinitely above ours, it means therefore when the same words are used to describe man as our, and to describe God, they cannot be saying the very same thing. All right. What God, as we've said, is often described as wrathful. His actions, then when carefully examined and correctly understood, are of a different nature than those of man. Could be the same with the emotion of jealousy, as we've seen here. Elijah said, I'm mean, jealous. God says, I'm a jealous God. but not necessarily saying the same thing. We don't see in the Bible where 
Elijah was given an instructions to kill the prophets of Baal. Nevertheless, he did 450. Could there have been a desire for revenge? You know, Elijah said, as we saw earlier, he said, I've been jealous for the Lord. They have forsaken, the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant. And this is what Jezebel had done and the prophets were prophets of Baal. She was the high priestess of Baal worship and her prophets, her priests were slain. And notice, and they've slain thy prophets. Could it be that somehow, subliminally, Elijah cherished a desire to slay her prophets too? He was the one of like passions as we are. And he says, and even I'm the only one left. They've killed all the prophets. That was his, 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 his word. Those were his thoughts. No. So could there have been a desire for revenge maybe? We read in 1 Kings 18 and verse 4, for it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by 50 in a cave and fed them with bread and water. So faithful Obadiah was there also looking out. But Elijah admitted to jealousy. Could he also have harbored feelings of revenge for the killing of the Lord? This question, could he maybe? For the killing of the prophets of the Lord, many of whom he likely knew. Maybe some of them were his friends. Remember, he was a man subject to like passions as we are. Elijah had won a great victory on Carmel. The hearts of Israel were turned back to God. The false prophets were exposed and then eliminated. And rain had come in answer to Elijah's prayer to end the three and a half year drought. Remember now, there was an issue of pride too. Because Elijah had to pray seven times before the rain came. And in the spirit of prophecy, prophets and kings, it shows us where Elijah was being brought deeper and deeper to examine himself. You know, as a, with like passions as we are, it can be a heady experience. It can be a very heady experience, that showdown that took place there. And even without realizing it, we can be lifted up in our hearts, you know. Wow. Yes. We can even be subconsciously taking some of the credit without even realizing it. And so the spirit of prophecy says, which each prayer, the Lord took him deeper and deeper into self-examination, deeper, purging what had come into his heart. Deeper until he needed to be emptied again. And when it's emptied, the seventh time he prayed, there was a cloud in the horizon and it was a rain cloud. It got bigger and bigger, came close and the rain came. So, Rain came in answer to Elijah's prayers to end the three and a half years drought. It was a great victory. Israel said, the Lord, he is God. And they renounced Baal worship. But sometimes, you know, after a great victory, a relatively small threat can bring a person down. I don't know if any of us, probably some of us can look back at life and see that sometimes after a great victory, a relatively small threat can bring a person down. You know, because usually after a great victory, you're expecting nothing but to go forward like a champion without challenge. But the threat in this case came from an enraged woman, Jezebel. First Kings 19, 1 to 4, and Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. And withal, how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. So Jezebel, no, that was a spunky woman. She had some spunk. She didn't, you know, um, she didn't play around. She didn't mince words. She said, Elijah, by this time tomorrow, you're dead. You're as dead as those prophets of mine that you killed. 
And it says, look, Elijah's response, a man who had just gone through a mighty victory. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life. That word went could also be put, exchanged, means the same thing as fled for his life. And he came to Beersheba. That was not, and that was not just down the road or across a few blocks down or the edge of town. That was another city entirely. He came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, one of the outskirts cities of Palestine, way out there somewhere. And he left his servant there. So he, with his servant, Elijah said, okay, you stay here, you wait. <laughs> you safe. It's not you that Jezebel wants, it's me. So you, in a Beersheba, you can stay here. I'm going further. He says, but he himself, he left his servant there, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die. Lord, I want to die. That sounds like Jonah. Huh? This is a mighty Elijah. He requ after a great victory, he requested for himself that he might die. And he said, it is enough. No, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. Think about that. This was clearly a threat by Jezebel to get revenge. Sometimes we get what we give out, you know. It seems possible that Elijah had feelings of revenge and he acted on them and became the subject of revenge from another. Because the weakness showed in the aftermath of such a mighty victory shows that there was something that was unsettling in his mind. Come on, you faced on 450 priests and a woman sends a threat. All our priests are dead now anyway. And he's fleeing like a madman. And not just fleeing, he flees to a city on the outskirts of Palestine and he leaves and he goes over to another area entirely in the wilderness. Another day's journey. Now at the speed at which Elijah moved, a day's journey is a long way off. He, nearly, he ran himself ragged. Could it be that Elijah realized sub, sub, subliminally he knew that he had his conscience was bothering him and he knew that he, the, there are certain principles, you know, which we will see in the New Testament, which we don't need from the New Testament necessarily because these are principles that are embedded within us all through human history, like sowing and reaping. Could it be that Elijah probably realized that he had did a little bit of sowing, which was not quite what God intended. And now with his conscience pricking, he probably feels like, okay, I'm going to have to reap from my sowing. Because after such a mighty victory, if he 100% felt like it was in, he was fully in God's will in everything that he did, he would be emboldened. He would probably walk down to the palace and say, Jezebel, I'm here. unless God sent him otherwise, but we know that God didn't send him on this mad rush away from town. So it seems possible that Elijah had feelings of revenge. He acted on them, and then he became the victim of those same feelings as they know brought guilt or remorse or, or fear upon him. He was a man of like passions as we are. Elijah, because this is natural to, to our, this is, we know this inherently, whether Jew or Gentile, whether believer or unbeliever, we know this principle inherently, even though human beings have shown through history that they, they, they cannot seem to avoid it, as we see why we have so many wars all through history. But this is the principle. Then Jesus said unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Matthew 26, 52. Another principle which Elijah might have been familiar with, or aware of at least, Romans 12, 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. 
So could it be that Elijah was, lift, was hit by pangs of realizing that his anger of his friends being killed by Jezebel so viciously and all those three years of hardship and all that being happening, ravishing the, the, the people of God and the, the nations around and everything and all the evil that came out of that. Could it be that he, and the fire came down, his point was proven, the people's hearts were turned around. He just ordered the priests of Baal killed and that was not God's will, but he stepped out of God's will because he allowed his passions to control him in that moment of victory. Could it be? And as a result of recognizing the pangs of that afterwards, he now had fear, which explained his response to Jezebel's threat. You see, on receiving the message from Jezebel, Elijah, who had fearlessly delivered warnings to King Ahab, and he had faced on hundreds of the prophets of Baal. Baal, he got a message from Jezebel and he succumbed to fear. He fled for his life. How could this have happened? Remember, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. And perhaps while we do not hear it stated, Elijah may have been aware of the principle that he who lives by the sword dies by the sword. And so in the aftermath of such a great victory, in the reality of that hit him, he fled. So the prophet was in flight. Fleeing. His first emotion after receiving the message was fear. Come on. It's not so easy to be fearful, especially of a little threat coming from a woman. No disrespect, women. But after you have faced down hundreds of men in an open public showdown and you maintained your composure and your calm and you were just so mightily used. And in the aftermath, that let down period, the aftermath of that, a little, and you flee like that. He could have sent a message back to Jezebel expressing his confidence in the protection of God who had thus far wrought mightily on his behalf. He could have done that. But could there have been something why he didn't do that as naturally a prophet of his statue? He could have done and knew he could have done and would have, should have done. Why didn't he do that? Jezebel, haven't you heard what happened on Mount Carmel today? The very same God who mightily moved on my behalf will protect me from even you. Could it be that there was Fear triggered by the deep realization that maybe he took things into his own hands at one, at so, at one point, at some point. Too bad at this point he didn't recall some of the promises of divine protection in the Psalms. You know, fear is described as, you know, in an acronym form, F-E-A-R, false expectations appearing real. And that was very likely what was happening in this case. He had claimed God's protection and stayed at the post of duty and the expectation, you know, of Jezebel's threat would not have happened if he had just claimed God's protection. Come on, this is right after Mount Carmel. I mean, it's easy for us to talk, by the way, 2,800 years later. But in reality, the ideal would have been, okay, take back a message to the queen for me, please, and ask her if she heard what happened on Mount Carmel today. That would have been the ideal. We talk about the spirit and power of Elijah, but clearly this was a time in which that spirit and power was clearly lacking. And the only thing that can drain that so much is a consciousness of having stepped out of God's will. So Elijah's reaction to the fear was to run for his life as far as he possibly could from Jezebel and Ahab. And that could have led to all kinds of feelings. Elijah's experience, you know, having just taken life was similar to that of Cain. Cain who fled after taking the life of his brother Abel. You know what did Cain say? You know, God, in Genesis 4, 14, he says, Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth. 
and from thy face shall I be hid. And I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. I mean, this could have been Elijah's thoughts running that way because the only way he could be running that way is if he felt like maybe he had done something which would have forfeited God's protection. Come on. Come, let's reason together. Could he have been entertaining that faint thinking, that sense of guilt that's triggering there that, you know what, I did something out of God's protection, took matters into my own hands, and so he fled, thinking that maybe he had done, probably broken, that was a straw that brought the camels back, not believing that he any longer had God's protection, he fled. Could it be? And so Elijah fled. In his words, we can see that he was suffering from failure. He was feeling pangs of failure and discouragement. The Bible says he went and he went under a juniper tree and I guess he, he, he sat down. After running, I think, about 90 miles, or traveling about that much, in a couple of days, I'm sure it was more like he not just sat down, but sprawled out in complete exhaustion. He, in his words, he requested for himself that he might die, as we just read that God would take away his life. And he said, I'm no better than my father's. In other words, whatever happened brought back to him something about the passions of his father's that he thought he had gone beyond that point. But then it confronted him and he realized that, look, the situation gave me a heady experience my passions were aroused. I took matters into my own hands. And in the aftermath of re in remorse, he said, I'm, not even, I'm no better than they are. Do we find ourselves sometimes messing up sometimes and we look back and we say, man, I thought I was beyond this point. I'm no better than I was before or whatever. But, and sometimes we feel like God has, you know, has like forsaken us. God is like, forget you now. Elijah, come on. After all I did today, come on, Elijah, uh -uh. I can't bother with you anymore. We get a feeling sometimes in our own little experiences, sometimes when we mess up, do we? Elijah could easily have had this feeling for leaving his post of duty at a critical time. It was a critical time. The people had just proclaimed that the Lord was God over Baal. Or oh, after years of Baal worship throughout Israel. From the highest position, the king all the way to the lowest. This was a massive turnaround. This was a critical time for the prophet to be there with the people in front of the people and lifting up the banner of, 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 of God, of Jehovah. But he, reality hit him now after driven by fear, which was triggered by guilt. He ran, feeling that he not, did not have God's protection. And he felt even more guilt now and hope, helplessness and wanted to die. Because he now he realized also, on top of all of that, he had left his post of duty at such a critical time. No more than ever, the people needed the guidance of the prophet to make that a reality in their lives, to make that God is God and not Baal, to make that proclamation a reality in your lives. But God went looking for him. And God said something to him, kind of like what he said to Adam in the Garden of Eden. You know, when he came looking for Adam after they said, Adam, Adam, where are you? God showed up and God said to Elijah, Elijah, what are you doing here? Elijah, I didn't expect to see you here. I was just passing by and I saw somebody. I said, oh, this looks like Elijah. And I come, it's you. What are you doing here, Elijah? <laughs> I mean, I... And God said, Elijah, you have to go back to work. Go back to work. It's kind of like that, you know, about getting right back on the horse after you fall off, get back on the horse and go riding again. So we see that he had discouragement. He wanted to die. His words seemed to indicate great discouragement. 
and the reality is this that these were just the the words that come out a result of knowing that you messed up and you don't even know what to say you know why because let's take it realistically if you really wanted to die you could have just stayed where you were and jezebel would have taken care of that matter she said she would but you didn't really want to die elijah that's why you run but what happened with the mighty prophet the one who is sometimes looked upon as the greatest prophet in the old testament He came to a point right after a great victory when it seemed as if faith and courage had left him. Is that possible? Guilt. First Kings 19, 9. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there and behold, the word of the Lord came to him and he said unto him, what doest thou here, Elijah? Elijah, what are you doing here? Elijah must have felt guilt towards God who he was supposed to be serving. Yet God did nothing to intensify that guilt. God said nothing to intensify his guilt. When Elijah finally got to where he felt safe. They went into this cave. Horeb, the Mount of God, whatever. Some people say Mount Tabor or whatever different names. First Kings 19 verse 8. When he, I guess, caught his breath and he could listen, God asked him a simple question. And the implication of this question, Elijah, what are you doing here? The implication of that question is that it implies that Elijah was not where he was supposed to be. This was very similar, as I said, to the question God asked Adam in Genesis 3 and verse 9. So, Adam, where are you? Not that he didn't know where Adam was, but Adam, what are you doing hiding? Both questions were very gentle reprimands. He was gently reprimanding them, saying, hey, holy, you've left your, 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 your post of duty. It was not stern condemnation to crush the soul or to, make him, to give, bring upon him even more overwhelming guilt. No, it was a gentle reprimand. And the question was given to Elijah twice. Elijah, where are you? Where are you? And both times with the same reply. I would think that Elijah must have had some guilt, yes. And other emotions as well. After the messy process of killing 450 men with a sword. And it's easy to read these things and say the mighty prophet did this. God must have condoned it. God must have, it must have been according to God's will for it to happen that way. And besides that, the Bible had clearly given a penalty. These are just little clues I look at to see that it could be that there was a somewhat a spirit of revenge and anger that took a hold of him at the moment right there in Mount, Mount Carmel when he realized that he had the upper hand and the people were clearly shaken and the prophets were clearly shaken and he finally had the upper hand and all the years of 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 of, of, of marinating in the thought of killing his all his friends and his fellow prophets and all the torturing and killing he still held some anger and some sp revengeful spirit towards it and it just came out and took over it could have been because notice that he had them killed with a sword and that was not even the penalty for idolatry that was given to them in the old testament for example in deuteronomy 17 verses 2 to 5 it says if there be found among you within any of thy gates which the lord had given thee man or woman that had wrought wickedness in the sight of the lord thy god in transgressing his covenant and had gone and served other gods and worshipped them, either the sun or moon or any of the hosts of heaven which I have not commanded, 
and it be told thee, and thou hast heard of it, and inquired diligently, and behold, it be true, and the thing certain that such abomination is wrought in Israel, then shalt thou bring forth that man or that woman which have committed that wicked thing unto thy gates, even to that man or that woman, and shall stone them with stones till they die. But we might ask, well, why was that kind, and how could that kind of command have been given by a holy God? But we will see why in a subsequent study. Because these commands which were given were not God's idea either. God was permitting them to function according to their own heart's desires. This is what they wanted to do. In fact, when we look at the Bible, the very first time we see stoning mentioned, it was shortly after Israel had been released from slavery in Egypt. And two, three days in the, in the wilderness, and they looked around and their water canteens had run out. After seeing the mighty power of God, and they decided, look, we want to stone Moses and go back to Egypt. And the next time, and when we see stoning, it was something that they had picked up from their, 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 their time among the heathens. It was, so Jesus himself explained in Matthew 19 that these laws were given to them because of the hardness of their hearts, meaning that these were things that they wanted and that's how they wanted their judicial system to function. And because they were not prepared to have God's way, God had to let them have their way. Just like when they wanted a king. The Bible makes it clear it was never God's idea. But that was what they wanted and God had to let them have their way. And over and over, we see this. I count at least 70 times in the Bible, and there are many more than that, but at least in the Bible, maybe 70 to 71 times in the Old Testament, where God said, this is what I want. They insisted they want their own way. I mean, so many, so many, I mean, so many places where they... God had to just let them have their own way. But over and over again, it would seem to suggest to the casual reader that that was God's intent or God's will or what God wanted. No, it was contrary to God's will. But the penalty for adultery was stoning. But Elijah was so caught up, he, he didn't even bother him think of that. I remember that. And these laws were given to them because that was God was giving them laws according to their own hearts. That's what they wanted to do. They wouldn't have had his way. But in the heat of passion, Elijah didn't remember all about that. Okay, guys, we are not supposed to chop off their head. We're supposed to stone them. At least let's stay, stick with the rules that were written in the book of Moses. No. Take them down, off with their heads. There was, this was another possible source of guilt for Elijah. Another source of guilt. And then... Later on, we see Elijah was reinstated. God mercifully comes and says, Elijah, you're not supposed to be here. You're supposed to be on the job. He was reinstated, but given notice. In other words, God said, Elijah, in order for me to break you out of this defectiveness, I'm going to train you. I have great things in store for you, though, but you don't know that yet. But 1 Kings 19, verse 16. God is talking to Elijah. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Milo, Mehola, shall thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. So he was reinstated, but given notice. Not immediately. Despite his failures, God recommissioned the prophet to return to his duties. His first task was to anoint three people to specific offices. And it is interesting that to one of those offices was essentially his own replacement. As we just see here in 1 Kings 19 verse 16. And many versions of the Bible are written in different ways. They express verse 16 here in different ways. Some says to succeed you as prophet. That like NIV says to succeed you as prophet. The New Living Translation says to replace you as my prophet. 
or something similar. One could almost think that Elijah was thus given notice that his term as prophet was soon to end. However, he continued to serve for several years more as prophet of God while tutoring his successor, Elisha. And one would hope that over this time he regained his confidence and he overcame the tendencies to be subject to his own passions. Evidently, he did. And that is why God could later on say, Elijah, I'm sending a chariot for you. I want you to come up and be here with me. So think about that. We're going to stop right here. Think about that. There is hope for us even if we have certain defects that we're struggling to overcome. Elijah had them too. Near the end of his term, Elijah was called upon to meet another crisis. This one involving the son of Ahab, King Ahaziah. Ahaziah. He had succeeded Ahab, his father, on the throne of Israel. And Ahaziah, or Ahaziah, was sick and had sought to inquire of Beelzebub. I mean, after all that had happened with his father during the time of Baal and all that, he knew all about that. And he sent to inquire of Beelzebub regarding his recovery. And Elijah gave him a message, which was a fierce message. But we'll pick up that. That's just to whet your appetite a little bit. We pick up that in part two, which would begin naturally right here. When we look at Elijah and the captains of 50s and seek to determine whether Elijah's actions were God's will for him at that time. There is something here that I want to mention. It's found in Luke chapter 9. And this is just to bolster the point that I've been making all along. And this verse, it goes up to in the verse 50s. And notice this, Luke chapter 9 from verse 51. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, speaking of Jesus, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. And they went and they entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elijah did? So notice here, you know, one of the actions of Elijah, which we will see next week when we look at the captains of the 50s, was when he called on fire and it came down from heaven. Well, it says it came down from heaven. We understand what that means. Because in the book of Job, when Satan went out to afflict Job, lightning, fire came down from in the skies, came down and, and, and destroyed his, his, his animals and his servants and whatever. And what did they say? Fire came down from heaven. It was just an, an, just a, an expression that was used. It's coming from up there, so it's coming from heaven. Lightning. Doesn't come from heaven either. either. God doesn't have electrical, violent electrical charges with negative and positive charges happening in paradise. This is happening in our fallen world system. Fires, breakout, lightning, all these things, thunderstorms. But notice, Elijah, something had happened. We're not talking about Mount Carmel now, when fire came down and destroyed some men. The disciples evidently thought, hmm, this must have been according to God's will. But God was in their presence right now, in the flesh, walking with them. The very God that spoke to Elijah, which we just saw speaking to Elijah, said, Elijah, where are you? That very God was now in human form, standing with them right there. And the disciples, looking back at something Elijah did and thought it was a righteous act and must have been in harmony with God's way and God's functioning, said, Lord, his disciples, James and John, saw this. They said, Lord, can you imagine? They're insulting you. It's coming to nightfall, and we want to stop in this Samaritan village so that you can have a night's rest and resume our journey tomorrow. And just imagine the gall of these 
unclean, uncircumcised Samaritans, they're saying, no, you, the creator of the earth, can't come into our village. Lord, we have the perfect solution. Elijah did too. Why don't we, just like Elijah did, call on fire from heaven and destroy their whole village? So they saw something from the Elijah's ministry and thought that, well, God must have been in it. But notice what God himself says on the matter right now. Notice Jesus' response. But he turned and rebuked them and said, you know not what manner of spirit you're of. In other words, my dear disciples, the spirit that prompted Elijah to do that act is not my spirit. So if you look at that act as something that God had anything to do with, and you tried to now use it to justify doing the same thing here with these Samaritans, even though he had re they have rejected me. He says, no, let me show you what I do when I'm rejected. Notice, he says, but he turned, verse 55 and 6, but he turned and rebuked them and said, you know not what manner of spirit you're of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And what did he do? What does he normally do when he's rejected? And they went to another village. He quietly leaves and goes someplace else. Questions? <laughs>